Hello and welcome to another math video. Uh, this video is for uh, an Honors Algebra 2 uh, Chapter 3 practice test. Uh, we get started with solving systems of equations, either using substitution or elimination. Uh, I'm only going to show one way or the other. I will not be showing both. Uh, you are certainly free to choose to do the opposite. And of course, we begin with one of the tougher questions. Notice the decimals here. Um, Again, if you wanted to use substitution, it would be fairly straightforward to uh, solve for that second y uh, in this equation here. And that would be fine. It would work pretty well. Um, personally, I just wanted to avoid using uh, or keeping those decimals at all. So what I looked at was that if I multiplied this top equation by, uh, by 2 that I could get rid of those decimals there, and that's the smallest number I could really uh, multiply by to get that to happen. So that would give me x minus 10y equals negative 25. Um, with the bottom equation, the 1.75, now you might, have, might think you have to multiply by 100 to get rid of that, but since the two decimals we have are 0.75, so that's actually 3 fourths, you could get rid of that decimal by multiplying by 4. Now I understand you might not want to look at it that way, and that's perfectly understandable. This is just how I decided to do this. So I get 7x minus 4y equals negative 43. Now, again, still substitution would still be a good choice now. All of a sudden, though, it's that first x that we could solve for pretty easily. Uh, again, I decided to stick with the... Uh, elimination method, and so what I did is I multiplied this top equation by negative 7. Um, I'll come back over here, so that gives me negative 7x plus 70y equals 175, and I have 7x minus 4y equals negative 43. Uh, I know the numbers get to be not very nice, uh, but the x's do go, go away. We get 66y equals 132, and we divide by the 66, and we find out that y is 2. So again, that's half of the answer. I know y is 2. Um, I would probably actually go to uh, this purple equation here in order to find x. It's got the single x there, which is nice. So if I do that, I get x minus 10 times 2 equals negative 25. So x minus 20 equals negative 25. Add the 20, we find that x is negative 5. Uh, again, if you want to leave your answer like that, that's fine with me. You could also write that as an ordered pair, negative 5, 2. I would certainly recommend always taking the time to double-check your answers by plugging them back into the originals. You may want to do that with a calculator considering the decimals here, although, uh, again, you may just be able to handle that also. Uh, so that's the first one. Our second one is a bit more reasonable. Uh, this one is pretty well solved for x already. We've got a negative x, so I would multiply both sides of that equation by a negative 1. Uh, that would give me uh, x equals negative 2y minus 7. So then what we do is we take that negative 2y minus 7, we replace x in that equation with that. Uh, so when we do that, we get 3, and then negative 2y minus 7, plus 6y equals 6. If we distribute that 3, we get negative 6y minus 21, plus 6y equals 6. Well then, what happens, notice the negative 6y and the 6y are both on the left side of the equation. So those actually cancel each other out. We get negative 21 equals 6. Now, of course, that's a false statement. Negative 21 does not equal 6. So that means that there is no solution for this system. If we look at that, and they do a good job of hiding it in this case, but those two lines are actually parallel, uh, and so they never cross, so no solution for that one. So that's what we're looking for there. Uh, it's just that statement that there, it's never true, there's no solution. Uh, the third one, uh, again, you could use a substitution, but I believe that uh, elimination works quite a bit better in this case, especially... Multiply that second equation by 2, so I'll just write down that first one again, 6x plus 4y equals negative 2, and then we get negative 6x minus 4y equals, so that was a negative 2, this is a positive 2, 
And look at that, when we add that together, everything cancels out. So we have 0 x's, 0 y's, and 0. So 0 equals 0, which of course is true. And so what we're saying is that there are many solutions to that. And really the solutions would um, all be ordered pairs that would make either of those two equations true. Um, but for right now, we're just saying that that's enough uh, as far as describing the answers. Uh, looking at number four, again, notice uh, substitution would be kind of tough to use there, so I would lean towards uh, elimination. Uh, you are going to have to multiply both equations. I would multiply this top equation probably by five, and the second equation by a negative three. Now, you could do a negative five and three, uh, that would be fine. I just chose to do that because at least the second one had one negative that would flip to positive, whereas the first one was all positive and did not want to necessarily switch that all to negative. So I get 15x plus 35y equals 45. And the second equation ends up being negative 15x, that's why we did that. Uh, plus 9y equals negative 45. Well, so that's interesting already, noticing that uh, we've got a 45 and a negative 45. So we add those together, we get 0x's, so I'm not going to bother writing that down. We get 44y, and you might be thinking, well, gosh, how is this going to work out? Well, 44y equals 0. You divide by 44, and of course y equals 0. Now, some people want to say that that's like no solution, or that's impossible, it can't work. Well, zero is just like any other number. We don't need to, you know, be biased against it at all. It's just zero. Uh, so certainly we can use that y is zero in order to find our value for x. Uh, I don't think it would make a big difference which equation we plug that into. I'm going to go ahead and plug it back into the top one. 3x plus 7 times 0 equals 9. So 7 times 0, of course, is gone. We get 3x equals 9. So divide by 3, we get x equals 3. Again, it would be pretty simple to check that. I would certainly recommend taking the time to do so uh, so that you're confident that you have the right answer. Again, it's got to work in both equations, and 3, 0 is pretty easy to check. On the first equation, you get 9 equals 9, and the second one, you get 15 equals 15. So certainly looks like it works. Uh, again, really confident that it works. And there we go. And again, if you wanted to write it as an ordered pair or leave it as x equals 3, y equals 0, either way, is fine. All right, so looking at number five, this one actually is ready to be added together, or we don't have to do anything to set this one up for elimination. Uh, we have a negative x and an x, and you might notice we also have a plus 2y and a minus 2y, so we actually get 0 on the left, but we get 5 on the right, so of course that's false. That means then that there is no solution. All right, so that brings us to um, kind of our word problem here. And so in this situation, we are told, there we go, I'm going to see the whole thing, uh, a group of 52 people attended a ball game, adult tickets are $8, child tickets are $3, um, what else do we know? We know the amount of collected at the ticket booth was $306. Question, how many adult and child tickets were sold? Write and solve a system to represent, uh, or that represents this scenario, or scenario, depending on how you want to say that. Uh, now, oftentimes when they ask you how many adult and child tickets were sold, that leads you directly to what your variables should represent. So I'm just going to have x equal the number of adult tickets and y equal the number of child tickets. I just don't want to mess around with a and c and, and all that stuff, so I'll just use x and y. You could do whatever you wanted, really, but I think, especially in this case, good to clearly define what those variables represent. Now, one of the things we know is that there was 52 people that attended the ballgame, so that means a total of 52 tickets. So, we could write the equation x plus y equals 52. Um, the other thing we know is that there's $306 collected for tickets. Well, if it's $8 per adult ticket and $3 per child ticket, then that total would give us $306. Again, this is why it's nice to have clearly defined which one is which, that way it doesn't get confusing. Um, now, certainly, substitution could work. You could solve that first equation for either x or y. 
Um, I'm a big fan of elimination, though. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply that top equation by negative 3. I'm not going to necessarily write that down, but this is what the result would be. You have negative 3x minus 3y equals, let's see, that would be negative 156. And that works out pretty well because I've got my 8x plus 3y equals 306. So when I add those together, I end up with 5x equals 150. Divide by 5, we find out that x is 30. So really, that's the number of adult tickets, which was 30. Now, if I know that x is 30, then I can plug that back in here pretty easily. 30 plus y equals 52. Well, that's not bad. We just subtract the 30, right? So y is 22. Now, with a word problem like this one, one of the most important things is to actually answer the question that was asked. In this case, it wasn't what is x and what is y. It was how many adult tickets and how many child tickets were sold. So actually saying there's 30 adult tickets and 22 child tickets. That's really answering the question. Again, they didn't mention x or y at all. We used x and y, or I did, um, just to make it easier for myself. Um, but they didn't ask us to find out x and y. They asked us how many adult and child tickets were sold. So make sure when you do these uh, applied problems that you actually answer the question uh, that we're looking at and not leave your answer just in terms of your x and y or whatever variables you chose to use. Alright, so looking at number seven, they want us to solve the system of inequalities by graphing, which basically means graph it. Um, so we'll take a look at these two equations, and again there's a few different ways you might go about graphing these. Personally, I look at that first equation, I think, man, that is just about in slope-intercept form. If I were just to rewrite that, that would just be y is greater than or equal to negative 3x minus 4. Well, that's going to be uh, a bit easier to graph. Uh, the other one's already in slope-intercept form, and of course I'll use my fancy colors uh, to graph that. So negative 4 for the y-intercept, slope of negative 3, so I can do a couple few points there. I can also go up 3 and left 1 in order to continue that pattern. Uh, and again, I'll do that a few times because I can. Now, both of these inequalities have the equal to, so they're both solid lines, which is nice because then I can't forget that I'm supposed to dash it. And the y value is greater than or equal to the negative 3x minus 4. Now, there are a couple of ways we can determine uh, where to shade. The uh, kind of basic way, but works just fine, is to use a test point. Now, my favorite test point is the origin. Uh, the reason I like that so much is it's very easy to plug things in. If I plug that origin into that first inequality, I get 3 times 0, which is 0, plus 0 is greater than or equal to negative 4. I get 0 is greater than or equal to negative 4, which of course is true. So since that's true, then I would shade on that side of my line. So I have to put arrows there because I don't know where these are going to cross yet. I don't know. So, so I just draw the arrow string that's shaded on that side. Now, a little trick on a different way of figuring that out. What I look at is uh, my x and my y. They're both positive. They're both on the big side of the inequality. Well, the x's and the y's, they get bigger. Y's get bigger as you go up the y-axis. X's get bigger as you go right on the x-axis. So that would indicate to me that we shade on this side of the line, the same thing that our test point showed us. So that's another way that we can do that. Now, if you have negative x's or negative y's, then it flips just the opposite. Notice here, when I solved it for y, now I've got a negative 3x. Well, so it's a negative 3x that's on the small side of the inequality. So typically, smaller x values are over here. But we've got a negative... Try to get that pointer back here. We've got a negative... So then it's the opposite, and it goes back this way. So whether the x or y is positive or negative, uh, you can still use that trick in order to figure out which side to shade. So kind of a nice thing if you understand it. Otherwise, just keep using a test point. It works out really well. Uh, the other line, let's do that line in blue. Uh, y is less than or equal to 1 3rd x plus 1. So of course, I start with my y-intercept, which is 1, and I use my slope of 1 3rd to get to some other points. Now in this case... Uh, we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily too worried about where they cross. We're not you know, asking for much of anything here other than just a graph to represent uh, the solution for this system of inequalities. And again, so my way of testing which side to shade, I would look at the y being on the small pointy side. Smaller y values are down the y-axis, so that would in indicate shading in that side of that line.
Um, x would be kind of the opposite. X is on the big side of the inequality, so I would indicate to the right on the x-axis, which is the same thing as what I already have. It's, it's this side here. Um, if they somehow disagreed, that would indicate to me that I did something wrong. Either the line is in the wrong place, or I, I misinterpreted or misread my x's and y's with the inequality. Again, you could still use the test point. 0, 0 also makes this one true. You get 0 is less than or equal to 1, which of course is true, so you'd shade that side. Now with my little arrows there, now I can see uh, what I come up with uh, for where the two things overlap. And so I shade that in. Uh, let's see if my uh, highlighter works here. I'm going to use green since I haven't used that yet. Hmm, so we shade this in because this is where the two lines shade together. So some sort of indication. Again, you don't have to cover every single spot or anything like that. Uh, with some kind of indication that, yeah, this is the shaded area that we're looking for. So, and again, it's just that one spot where they overlap. Okay, for number eight, we have a couple different types of graphs here. we got y is greater than or equal to 3. Hopefully, we all remember that that will be a horizontal line. The values of y are going to be greater than or equal to 3, and, of course, that will go up. Uh, again, you could use a test point. The origin would prove false. It would say 0 is greater than 3, so we or greater than or equal to 3. So we'd shade on the other side, which would be up. Uh, again, my way of looking at that, the y is on the big side. Y's get bigger as you go up the y-axis, so there you go. Uh, the other one is a, per, uh, sorry, not a parabola, uh, absolute value graph. So that's going to be our V-shape. So what I look at there is my a value is 2, my h value is negative 4. Remember, that's always the opposite of what it looks like, and my k value is 0. So that means that my vertex for that is at negative 4, 0, and the slope as you go to the right of the vertex is 2. So plot that vertex, negative 4, 0, and I go up to right 1. I could do that several times here, really, because why not, right? And then I also go up to left 1, because then the slope is the opposite as you go to the left. But notice the symmetry of the V-shape. Now, this one, notice, don't miss this, that's a greater than symbol, so make sure you dash that one. Uh, so I'll do my best to dash on here, not the easiest thing with the technology and whatnot, it's a little easier pencil and pen, but there you go. Now, where do we shade the absolute value? Really what we're looking at there is, do we shade inside the absolute value or do we shade outside of the absolute value? You could use a test point, of course, the origin would still come in handy there. You plug it in there, you see what happens. Again, I would continue to argue that the y being greater than something indicates to me that we would shade up the y-axis, which happens to be inside the absolute value. So then we're looking at above the y values being 3 and inside the absolute value. So we'd be looking at this area here. Here I'll use, whoops, that's not what I wanted. Let me get my highlighter here. So here we'll have uh, where we end up shading. I'll not be quite as obnoxious as the last one. We'll just do a pretty good job there. So again, shading. Oops, didn't want to do that. I don't want to go below this line. See if I can erase that there. There we go. Be careful. Don't do that. That's what I just did. Um, I'm in the mistake of shading below the water. was greater than equal to. You don't want to do that. So it should just come down to that line. Even over here, I should take care of that too, but I don't want to erase everything. There we go. So that looks a little bit better. So just uh, inside of the... Darn it, now I wanted my pencil back, and I didn't get my pencil back. Uh, let me try that again. All right, this will do it. All right, so inside here, and then that line and above. And, of course, it continues up, uh, you know, here as well. It's just we stop because that's the end of the graph. So there we go. That's what number 8 should look like. All right, by this point, you're probably thinking, finally, we're down to the last two questions, and believe me, I agree. Um, all right, so number nine, we have a bookstore makes $5 profit on hardcover books and $2.50 profit on paperback books. In order to make their daily goal, they need to sell at least 80 books. At any given time, the store stocks no more than 60 hardcover and 70 paperback books. They want an objective function and constraints 
uh, that represent the scenario. Now, notice they're not asking us to maximize it. They just want the objective function and the constraints. Really, that first question does, uh, or first sentence, I should say, speaks directly to our objective function. Now, let me see here. I'm going to just kind of identify hardcover as X and paperback as Y, uh, just so that we can use that. You could use different variables, certainly, um, and somehow communicate which one is which. But so for profit of this, uh, it would be $5 per hardcover and $2.50 per uh, paperback. Personally, I prefer paperback. I, you know, I figure it's the same book, whether it's got a hardcover or a paperback, so why not just read the paperback? Um, so that's our objective function. And then we get to our constraints. I do like to start with what I consider natural constraints. You cannot sell a negative number of hardcover books. You cannot sell a negative number of paperback books. So X and Y would both have to be greater than or equal to zero. Important not to forget those. Um, the next thing they say was that they need to sell at least 80 books. So and that just means that X plus Y has to be at least 80. So X plus Y is less than or equal to 80. But at the same time, they don't carry an unlimited number of books. They said they carry no more than 60 hardcover books. So hardcover, which was my X, is less than or equal to 60. They also carry no more than 70 paperback books. So paperback books, which was my Y, was uh, less than or equal to 70. Throw that all together, and we've got our objective function and our uh, family of constraints. And there we go. So that's what we're looking at for number 9. Now, number 10, they actually give us the uh, constraints and the objective function. And they want us to do a few things here. They want um, us to name the vertices of the feasible region. Um, so graph, really, given the system constraints, graph it, name all the vertices, find the maximum value for the objective function. So, uh, again, a couple different things there. Uh, let's see, okay, so graphing our stuff, so x is greater than or equal to 0, so that would actually be this line here, x, okay, veering off a little bit there, can ignore that, x is greater than or equal to 0, y is greater than or equal to 0, I guess I don't need to go all the way over there, but there we go, okay, so that's those two, they're both greater than or equal to 0, which would be this side, so not narrowed it down too much so far. The third inequality, y is less than or equal to one-third x plus 3. Let me switch to green. So it's in slope-intercept form. So, of course, we start with our y-intercept. And from there we go up one right three. I would just continue that pattern until I get uh, to the point where I would go off the graph. Uh, maybe even go to the left here just so I have a nice line. And again, finding all the points is important because we don't know where these are going to cross. And since we want to find the vertices, it's kind of important that we do that. Now, the third inequality, I would solve for y. So I would subtract the x from both sides, but then I might also want to flip that around. Notice the y stays on the pointy side of the inequality. I'm subtracting the x from both sides, so I get negative x and then plus the 7. So rewriting it in slope-intercept form, really, is all I've done there. Plus, I just wanted to flip it so the y would be on the left, but notice that also flips the inequality. y stays on the small pointy side. So y-intercept of 7, let's see, let me find that. So it's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is way up here, and a slope of negative 1. So we can just continue our way down now. So this point here is important. And then we continue, 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 and then this point here is important. I'll just go one more. And we get our boundary line. There we go. So, uh, oh man, I never talked about shading for the green one. Let's go back and uh, do that quick. Okay, so green line. The y is less than or equal to 1 third x plus 3. Again, you could use the origin for a test point. That's perfectly fine. What I look at is the fact that y is less than something. y gets smaller as you go down the y-axis, which would be down this way. So that side would be the shaded area. The blue line, again, once I rewrote it also, you can see y is less than something. That happens as we go down the y-axis, which would be on this side. And again, I like to do a couple different arrows because I like an arrow on each side where they cross so I can see. Um, all right, so now... And, of course, the purple ones, you know, this side, this side. So we're looking at this area here is the one that will shade. So I'll just grab my highlighter quick. And good thing I can't misplace those. Man, I've used all my colors. Let me maybe switch colors. What should I use? Maybe I'll use orange. I like orange. All right, so filling this in. It's kind of a big highlighter. It's hard to, to get those small corners, so you know what I mean, though, um, for that. Okay, so now we're ready to go ahead and name the vertices. So one of my vertices, whoops, didn't want that. I wanted my marker back or my pen. 
Let me change that quick. Okay, back in marker. Maybe I'll switch my color again because I've used a lot of colors already. Let me use red. Okay. So zero zero. I know the red and the orange clash, but you know, deal with it. Uh, zero three. Uh, let's see what's this one. This is three four. And this is uh, so seven zero. And there's a lot going on right there. So that's seven zero. Okay. So I'm gonna just list those over here. So the vertices are the origin zero 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 three. 3, 4, and 7, 0. Okay, now, we need to figure out which one maximizes the objective function. Now, the objective function is p equals 6x plus 3y. Now, if you look at that, what you might notice is that the x's are really valued at twice as much as the y's based on that objective function. So you might say, well, hey, that 7, 0 has got a lot of x's. The p value there for that objective function would be 6 times 7, which would be 42, plus 3 times 0, which is nothing. So guess what? Objective function is 42 there. Um, that one is the maximum. It does not hurt to find the rest of them, though. Um, let me use a different color then, since these aren't it. Uh, of course, very easy there. The p is 0, uh, p is 9, when y is 3, and x is 0. Now, 3 and 4, that's a little bit more work. We get 6 times 3, which is 18. 3 times 4, which is 12. 18 and 12 makes 30. So that's what we're looking at there. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I would want to uh, identify which one is the maximum. Maximum happens at 7, 0, and the maximum is 42. Um, and, of course, the graph with all its uh, beautiful colors and shading and whatnot. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you found this helpful, uh, and be sure to tune in again next time.